Hello and welcome. My name is Barkha Dutt. You're watching The Mojo Story, our digital platform that has been at the forefront of the COVID-19 pandemic reportage. Today, we turn our focus to something that is extremely important to all of us. What might the imminent third wave mean specifically, if anything at all, for children? There has been some anticipation that the third wave could hit children badly, but this has been contested by other scientists. Now we finally have the results of a survey from the city of Mumbai. This is an extremely critical zero positivity survey. And let's bring up what it in fact tells us. It tells us that 51.8% 1.8% of children in Mumbai already have antibodies for COVID. In other words, they have already been infected. Now, this is the breakup of what the age group looks like. And the maximum number of antibodies were found in the age group of children between the ages of 10 to 14. These are extremely critical findings because, remember, the Maharashtra task force had argued that the state needed to prepare special COVID hospitals for children because they believe that the third wave could hit children badly. This was also used as an argument to not reopen schools for the time being. But given these findings, and remember that this is a sample size of a little over 2,000 children, what does it mean uh, in terms of the safety uh, of our children? Because if so many are already infected, by the way, that sounds like bad news, but it is actually good news. And to explain why it's good news, let me bring up a panel of experts uh, on the screen now. Uh, let's introduce them uh, one by one. Uh, we're joined uh, on the program by Dr. Surbhi Rathi of the Nair Hospital. We're also joined, uh, let's bring her up next, uh, by Dr. Gargi Kakani, also of the Nair Hospital. And leading this team and leading this survey is Dr. Jayanti Shastri. Uh, wonderful to have you back on the program, ma'am. So these three uh, doctors whom I've just introduced, and I'll, bring, I'll introduce Samir in just a second, but these three doctors have led the survey. Dr. Samir Dalbai is a member of the Maharashtra Task Force. Remember, we've been saying that the task force has been arguing that the third wave will disproportionately uh, hit small children. And Chandrakant Laheria, one of our best known epidemiologists, he's been arguing the opposite. He's been saying there is no scientific basis to say that the third wave will actually single out children in particular. I want to start with Dr. Shastri because, ma'am, your survey and you know your two colleagues who worked with you on the survey are also present. If we can bring up Dr. Shastri, actually tells us that more than 50% of those you surveyed already had antibodies, which means that they were already infected. First, can you explain was these symptomatic or asymptomatic, or did you largely find that kids were COVID positive uh, without even knowing uh, that they were? So, Barkha, uh, thanks for inviting me to this show. So Mumbai is divided into 24 wards and a representative population of children from each ward were included in the survey and uh, samples were uh, collected uh, by unlinked anonymous method from the public as well as the private labs. So they were representative of the slum and the non-slum population of Mumbai. But these were the children who had come to the healthcare setting to give a blood draw for some or the other reason. It was not for COVID. So there is no way for us to know whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic. But yes, they did come to the healthcare facility to give blood for a number of reasons. And this is after the requisite blood tests were done. We had collected these samples from the public uh, labs, the Apli Chikitsa labs of BMC, as well as from two private labs to assess the zero prevalence of COVID-19 in this population. Now, the fact that these were children, Dr. Shastri, who came for other reasons, I think it's safe to assume that most of them were uh, asymptomatic or if, you know, if they had symptoms of COVID, they didn't recognize them to be necessary to get a COVID test in specific. Absolutely. They could have been asymptomatic, but we did not uh, capture that history about whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic. However, we really wanted to assess the zero prevalence, and this was the best we could access blood samples. Now, I want you to explain to people who are not, as, as they say in Hindi, ghusod into the COVID story as, as, as we are, why this is good news. You know, a lot of people here, a big number of people have antibodies, a big number of people were infected, and they say, bap re bap, this is bad news. This is good news going into the third wave. Yes, because we conducted this survey uh, with, from April 1st to June 15th. 
and that was the time when we were in the grip of the second wave so at that period uh, we found that uh, the number of children exposed to the virus were as high as 55.51.18 uh, and uh, a similar sero survey 3 which we had done in the month of march uh, we found that below 18 the sero uh, prevalence was 39% so more number of children were exposed to the virus in the period april 1st to june 15th so so many children who have accessed healthcare are already exposed so we presume that there would be definitely the numbers would be much more Now, before I uh, actually open this up for the rest of the panel, I want to ask you, Dr. Shastri. Uh, Samir is here, and the Maharashtra task force was very worried that the third wave uh, could hit children disproportionately. You had other scientists like Chandrakant who said there was no basis in science for that. What this zero survey is telling me is that a sizable number of children have already been infected, and therefore have built up good resistance to a possible third wave. And your sample size was a little over two thousand, which means probably I don't know if we were to model this, if the sample size were to be bigger, this percentage of children infected could be even bigger. I don't know, or the absolute number certainly could be bigger. Sure. So, do you think that there is a danger of the third wave hitting children, Dr. Shastri, uh, in specific, as the Maharashtra task force has argued? So, the inference we have given of our study is that since the number of children exposed are over fifty percent, definitely disproportionately, we do not expect the children to be affected. However, yeah. we are making suitable preparations, but we do not expect the children to be disproportionately uh, affected by the third wave. If there is a third wave, all right, we will talk about whether there is a third wave or not, and what we understand in a bit. I want to still keep our focus on the zero survey, Samir. Uh, you know, this could mean that the Maharashtra task force, some would say, was being alarmist. Some would say it was just preparing for the worst. In the light of the zero survey, would you change your advice to the Maharashtra state government to set up? a uh, specific for example covid child hospitals uh, and the other preparations that the task force was embarking on yeah good evening varga ji so this is a proverbial statement that the glass is half full isn't it and uh, that's exactly what it's telling us that 50% of children have been exposed the first good news if you may permit me to say is that none of these children we were at least we have seen were suffering from any bad effects of covid so the good news for parents is what we have been saying again and again is 85 to 90% of children who do get covid will have asymptomatic or mild forms of covid where you won't even be hassled about it so this proves that in hindsight that the children who get covid 90% of them will have mild or asymptomatic form having said that we also must say that this 50% did get covid in the last one year one year three months so mm -hmm. it does mean that in the next year the remaining children are also going to get exposed now the point when it comes to public health is how quickly are the remaining 50% going to get exposed if we are able to stagger it which is what the first lockdown was intended to do if you are able to stagger the remaining 50% children over say a period of a year or a year and a half then there won't be a conglomeration of cases in a short duration of time and that is exactly what a wave is a large okay. number of children getting infected in a short span of time that's a wave the problem with the wave it doesn't change the fact that 90% children will still be asymptomatic or mild but what it does the 8 9% who will be a little more symptomatic who need medical care if that gets conglomerated in a short span of time the absolute number of cases rise and then that tends to overwhelm the medical care system so one okay the maharashtra task force also agreed and has always been agreed that there is no specific evidence to say that if at all the third wave comes it will target children more or harm children more than adults having said that if they all conglomerate during a short span of time then the absolute numbers of children reaching the hospitals may be very large so we have been preparing for that but my final submission is if we as a people understand this and continue covid appropriate behavior and wear masks do not go out in public especially take care of the children 
and we are able to prevent a large number of children getting infected in a short span of time as and when they get infected slowly there is nothing to worry we'll be able to take care of them so the okay. most important reading for me from the zero survey is covid appropriate behavior has worked and hopefully will continue to work and prevent a wave in children okay so let me take this now to the panel i'll first go to uh, to you dr surbhi uh, and i also believe that you have been a teacher to uh, to samir so feel free uh, to contradict him and not alone for that reason uh, here's the question i think what i'm hearing from dr shastri and dr dalwai is the following if children do contract it it's not anything to be alarmed about they will mostly recover on their own without even knowing that they had uh, the virus but that children can still be vectors right uh, they can still carry the infection home uh, to parents uh, and therefore that could lead to a swelling of the numbers and thereby create a third wave even if there isn't one uh, that seems to be the argument that samir is making in terms of preparing for this let me be a little contrary and say please tell us what we can learn from other countries who are which are smaller but who have kept their schools open whereas we are a country that has opened our malls before we opened our schools you know so what is the medical reason for that and what can we draw from the results of the zero survey that should maybe at least get us to start talking about opening schools again in some hybrid model well uh, first of all uh, can i just get back to what samir was saying that the absolute number if it gathers together that is a wave now if we look at it even if 50% children show that they have been infected the absolute number who sought admission for covid was not that overwhelming so that is one thing which will again is a very good uh, thing for us that even if the glass is half full and we do have children coming up we the absolute number is unlikely to be very high though i agree with the task force that it's better to be safe than sorry about schools i would say barkha i think we should still uh, be a little skeptical about it because the covid appropriate behavior has really not sunk in that well especially because children can be very defiant about wearing masks especially the little toddlers the preschool age group and for that matter even the adolescents can be very defiant so till this is really drilled in well that they need to wear masks they shouldn't be pulling it out i mean if you look at a school playground half the masks will be down and if they contract it from here i'm sure they'll carry these this vector home and they will pose a threat more than to themselves to the senior citizens and to the uh, middle the other population so that is a major worry and if we can manage pretty well i would say online i think till we are really sure about this third wave we should continue schooling online i know so it's I would, a very big loss to the children yeah. because it's a different thing to be in a class to be with your friends and to enjoy in school the parents are also very hassled about this but i would still say we need to be very very cautious on this okay so i want to take this to to chandrakant who has uh, from the beginning been arguing that there is no basis in science uh, to talk oh, i think we lost him just at that moment so let me bring in uh, dr gargi uh, you know the fact is if you assume that adults more than more adults are getting vaccinated and you assume that the majority of children that your survey looked at did not need hospitalization does it not mean that we could in fact look at opening up i just want to push sulvi on a point that it's not safe to open up because we don't have a vaccine or right or rather we don't have enough vaccines but children are going to be vaccinated right now so the vaccination is going to be among the adult population if the adults are if a sizable number of adults are vaccinated garki and 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 the, even if the children are infected one has to assume that it's okay like at some point one has to stop talking in of positive cases in alarmist terms i don't know if you agree dr karthi thank you so much for that question um so this zero survey uh, looks at the antibodies which tell us whether the children have been exposed however uh, these antibodies whether they are protective or not that is yet to be determined because not all antibodies offer uh an immunity to the virus so even if the antibodies are present 
that doesn't mean that they will not have uh, an infection later on it just shows that they have been exposed to the virus and it uh, like surbhi rathi ma'am said that they uh, that the covid-19 uh, appropriate behaviors was not being followed in this age group so what is the biggest significance gargi of this finding of the findings that we are seeing on the screen i'll take it back to dr shastri also but if you want to add a thought uh the biggest significance is that um covid-19 appropriate behaviors should be targeted to this age group in a manner that they understand this age group is largely on social media platforms and uh they respond to uh to uh, memes or you know cartoon advertisements or you know catchy jingles so it should be uh, given to them in a palatable manner that makes them want to follow the covid-19 appropriate behaviors i just want to go back to dr uh, jayanti shastri if i can and you know i can see chandrakant also uh, joining us and we'll reconnect with him in a moment if we can come out of these graphics uh, dr shastri if we do not know about the neutralizing antibodies whether these antibodies are indeed neutralizing how long do they last you see at some point we've got to start talking about reopening uh, the country and reopening education and somewhere we need to make education a bigger priority than shops and malls and cinema halls and gyms and all the rest of it so one is uh, you know what do we know about the nature of these antibodies two i'm curious to know because i know that you also did zero surveys last year among adult populations is there any difference uh, in in how you find children responding to the second wave as compared to the first wave because that has been the whole debate do we have any data on that uh, jyoti shastri see I'll, that's what i said in the month of march we did a zero survey when uh, the below 18 population had 39% and uh, from april to june it was it has really jumped up to uh, 51.18% so answering your question you touched upon the neutralizing antibodies now we've had so many discussions in the past about how these binding antibodies are translating into neutralizing antibodies i will tell you there was complacency uh, until march 2021 okay the sudden fear was with the rising variants now i will give you uh, so uh, the, as far as the zero survey goes exposure and a presence of binding antibodies is one part the second part is whether it confers immunity which we really don't know as of now we even don't know how much of neutralizing antibodies is adequate uh, to confer protection so with all these gray areas let's move on to the variants now what are we seeing in the variants we are seeing that there is no cross protection now this is a case from a delhi doctor who had an mm, reinfection within 19 days the first was by the alpha variant and the second by the delta variant so what we have observed is that even if antibodies are present they are not Uh, conferring protection against the delta variant no, no but they are but are they but are they offering protection against the disease as opposed to the infection you see that's what uh, the vaccine is meant to do so yes. we know that they produce protection we know that against the delta variant but is it as long as the vaccines are stopping hospitalization mortality and morbidity both wouldn't you say that the vaccine is doing its job ma'am yes yes that of course uh, varies from individual to individual i have seen people with delta variant having mild infection and i have also seen uh, delta variant patients who are severe no when fully vaccinated to, fully vaccinated fully vaccinated, people fully vaccinated. yes we okay. had so we are undertaking a study on breakthrough infections in mumbai and we have seen all sorts so so let me come back to covid shield mm -hmm. and covaxin these are the two vaccines which are available when you speak about uh, across the globe look at the kind of disparities in the vaccines which are made available now when you talk of the us they have the pfizer and the moderna they are all offering and conferring so much of protection as against our uh, covid shield and covaxin when it comes to opening schools you have to vaccinate everybody with the right 
uh, vaccine. Number one, of course, ensure that everybody is vaccinated. Second, of course, that we all get booster doses of the most appropriate vaccine, which can protect us against variants. So I think I have answered your question. So if you yeah. have anything, that will yeah, I'll, I'll I'll come back with more questions. I'll just want to get Chandrakant uh, in this. You know, Chandrakant. I mean, actually, I, you know, one has to say that the what Dr. Shastri is suggesting is that the mRNA vaccine is definitely more effective against uh, the variants. One, uh, two, uh, to your point about the children, you've long been arguing that there's nothing very specific about a third wave in children, but you heard what Dr. Dalwai said, that children can still be vectors, and therefore you can see the numbers just swell uh, on that basis. What is your takeaway uh, of the findings of this survey? So this is not the first zero survey but we have uh, got such kind of information. Whenever the zero surveys were done in children, we have always found that the proportion of children who got uh, antibody is very similar to the adult population. While we also know that the children do not get develop, uh, develop severe disease. This had been the case in Delhi zero survey which looked at the children. This had been the case in the more recent zero survey, uh, especially all India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi and WHO had conducted one survey in five cities across different states. They have found, uh, especially Delhi Zero Survey found that around 73.4% of children of the total sample size had developed some form of antibody and that finding was even before the uh, second wave in Delhi. So all Zero Surveys have found that children have been getting infected uh, far greater rate or at the same rate as adults. We know that children do not develop severe disease, so this is not surprising to me. And this is uh, definitely very assuring that uh, the same pattern is being followed. And there is, but with this, these findings, it also depends how are we going to interpret this. In my opinion, there is no reason also to believe that uh, children are going to be disproportionately affected in subsequent way because they are going to be only susceptible population. They have always been susceptible population and they have been exposed to the people who were going outside and infected. But also, what one of the group uh, which uh, study the detailed data on uh, infection in the children and severe disease in children, they have found that especially in the pediatric age group and from medical science perspective, pediatric 0 to 18 years of age group, the disease, severe disease follow U-shaped pattern. What they have found that uh, usually 0 to 2 years are most uh, at the risk of developing severe disease and then 11 to 18 years. Usually 2 to 10 or 11 years are very minimal risk. And now this risk of severe disease is not uh, just like a 10 fold or 20 fold in comparison of uh, older population. What has been found that uh, chill, uh, in comparison of zero, younger children, the adult or uh, elderly are 5,000 or 6,000 fold higher risk of disease. So that's the lower risk in the children and this situation is unlikely to change. And we also know that 50% or 60% is really high. We don't, we will never achieve a 100% antibody level in any population. So what is left only 20% of the population, which would require an, a further antibody. Having put all of this together, I, as of now, even with the newer uh, variants of concern, do not see any reason that children would be at additional risk. I have always argued in the past that our approach to develop a standard health system should not be that just because children can get infected, our approach has to be a standing health system for all population. And then I'll come believe? to the final part of the vaccine, uh, Bharthadi. Yes, uh, yes. Vaccine, the Moderna and all other vaccines, I think uh, while efficacy is important part of, and we know that 92 to 95 or 96 percent efficacy has been found. But my, uh, I would, I think uh, some of the panelists would agree that the efficacy data is also dependent upon which setup the efficacy studies are done. If there are low transmission period, the efficacy studies are done. They are very different than the high transmission season or period. So, uh, if uh, theoretically, for me, 80% efficacy or 95% efficacy are not very different. Though they are different, but not very different. Would you? Would but you? What would you argue? Would you argue? The final point. Sorry, complete your point. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Complete so the point. breakthrough infection and all of those infections. What we need to remember, and there are Indian studies that breakthrough infections are only two to five percent, or even up to ten percent in one of the studies highest. So essentially, 90 to 98 percent of individuals are protected after vaccination. Now we need to remember the vaccine efficacy is always 80%. Nobody get immunogen immunogenicity after vaccination. So there would always be some people who would be uh, unprotected, who would, be, would not zero convert. 
and that would not be the fault of vaccines that is individual behavior sure. you react to that vaccine so uh, i would say that all things put together the current scenario the serious surveillance data and some more data and final part is uh, indian council of medical research is doing a nationwide serious survey of uh, on the same district where earlier serious survey were done which will provide more conclusive and especially since that serious survey is being done across the states and after the period of second wave like a waning off so we would get a better picture but th- till now evidence appears very assuring that while we need to prepare for third wave but we need not to worry for any age group but worry for all the age groups okay uh, let me take this to samir uh, you know what should ha- you know what what do we now know about this third wave one of the things jayati shastri said was if there is a third wave at all now obviously we've been so burnt by the second wave that nobody is going to take uh, any chances at all in preparation and that's how that's how it should be right uh, but there is there are huge debates everywhere uh, in the world and in india as well on how long you can keep countries closed and i keep coming back to that how long can you be keep uh, countries closed uh, one of the earlier thoughts samir in the first wave was that a natural herd immunity would be the way out of this pandemic now nobody wants to take that chance and everybody says it has to be a vaccine generated herd immunity for children that option is not available to indians for a long long time it may be available to the to britain it may be available to the americans but it's not available to us so for children are we hoping for a natural uh, herd immunity out of this mess Can we immunity. unmute Samir? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Natural immunity may be stronger as well theoretically than a vaccine immunity, but we can't take that chance. That's the first part. The second part is I completely agree with my friend Dr. Chandrakanti that the vaccination has been very effective, but there yet we cannot depend only on vaccinations now, right now, because there are some studies which are showing an even lower take of vaccination. So though vaccinations obviously don't harm, they are not. completely 100% productive as he himself said that and eventually the most productive part is only the mask and the social distancing and the covid appropriate behavior that is said that we have just been whacked by a very large second wave we all know that vaccine that virus is mutate or there are variants which develop when the virus is multiplying very rapidly so that we are aware now that just in the last couple of months the virus has been furiously multiplied so there is a chance that the delta and the delta plus or delta plus and there could be some other variants now we don't know exactly how the infectivity as well as the disease will progress for example we do know with delta and delta plus that transmissibility that is the number of people infected from one index case is much higher than the alpha variant and which is why you had such a rapid spread in say delhi but what i am told is in mumbai the infection was not as much by the delta as it was in delhi and that's why the overall second peak in delhi was two and a half times its first peak whereas in mumbai the second peak was only one and a half times more than its first peak so it depends on which variant we are looking at hence still the situation is evolving it's not very clear and i repeat my earlier point that if i do not want to have a conglomeration of a large number of pediatric cases in a short span of time because that would overwhelm my medical care and that is exactly what happened in the second wave as well we didn't have the infrastructure across especially rural india and there were a large number of cases i do not want that to happen to children and hence we must stagger if at all it comes to a fact where we have to start schools we will have to stagger it over a period of time so maybe we'll start with the higher classes or something like that but right now i don't think any of the governments are in a position to take that decision right away fair enough but maybe the alternative dr surbhi is to push for vaccines for children it's something that uh, pediatricians have been long arguing we had to fight to get pregnant women uh, the green signal to be vaccinated we finally got that uh, i know that as a country we don't have enough vaccines but not enough people are even talking about vaccines for children it's almost like we've decided do saal school bans hai to band hai well barkha Uh, i will go back to what samir mentioned and what this zero survey has really pointed out beautifully that 50% of children were infected how many of them really came in as serious patients hardly too many in the first and the second wave so natural immunity 
has its own role to play. I agree that we cannot obviate the necessity for a vaccine, but I think we can also look at it this way that if we follow the COVID appropriate behavior for some time, if we do not really have the vaccine in place and we can manage without opening the schools, I don't think we should be so alarmed about it because this survey has not only shown that, it has proved it that 50% were infected. We really didn't have such serious patients coming in as pediatric admissions. Another very big thing that this survey has proved, look, if I have to look as a pediatrician, what is my worry? Adults is fine, but when you treat children, it's a very, very sensitive matter because you got to handle those parents who are devastated that they would lose this child. It is so heartwarming to us as pediatricians that we are not really going to see an alarming and overwhelming disproportionate amount of children to have to like hundreds and thousands like the adults came in because it would be chaotic. One child needs so much attention than to handle the parents. I mean, you know, we would have to gear ourselves to double the strength that we have geared up now. So this survey has really been reassuring to us in that manner also. But and I just want to think, yeah, sorry, about the vaccines? You can about the you. vaccine, as I would say, that we cannot obviate its need, but then, okay, if we manage to withhold them home, if we follow these behaviors, natural immunity will take. We had the alpha variant, we had the beta, the delta variant. And children are coping with it pretty well, I would say. That, what that is pleases good. us more about children is the post-COVID complications that we were talking yes. of, MIC. That is what is more worrying than I would say as a pediatrician, the actual COVID occurring in these children. So, they so really one of, fight well. So one of the reasons I'm pushing for vaccines is not so much because the children's natural immunity doesn't work, but because it seems the, the only way that we can get back to schools. So there, there are two different uh, motivations. But but yes, Dr. Kargi, the important point, of course, is the schools were shut during this period that your survey uh, was done, uh, as you have pointed out. And uh, yet 50% of children uh, surveyed uh, were COVID positive. But that could also be because uh, these are young children whose parents are still within the working age group, possibly, who, uh, who have been going out more than the elderly. And even if they have been going out have not got the vaccines because the elderly got them first. Could that be a reason that explains uh, the 50% plus children who are COVID positive, Gargi? Definitely, 110%. Uh, to add to that, I also uh, see a few, um, you know, uh, like a group of children uh, in the building playing together. So even though they're not stepping out, so outside of the colony, they are still playing with their peer circle and they're still meeting their friends or even like just going up and down in the building because, uh, you know, humans are social creatures and we crave for social interaction. So I understand that they want to meet their friends and they want to play with them. But um, yes, uh, the, the fact that their parents are going out and uh, they're in the working class and that the fact that their parents might not have received the vaccines is uh, a possible explanation to uh, why so many uh, children were infected. Dr. Shastri, before I get Chandrakant to respond and give you the last word, a clarification on the survey. Is there any class dimension to it? Like, do we know what socioeconomic uh, class this is skewed in favor or is it across uh, socioeconomic types? No, uh, we have already uh, said that 54.36 from the public labs and about 47.03 from the private sector so it is like calling them slums and non-slums you know so it's not that it is uh, highly skewed but there's just a very slight uh, increase in the public sector which is bound to happen they have smaller homes number Fair of enough. people staying uh, together are more in a closed space However, sure. as Surbhi rightly said, it's a very, very uh, reassuring uh, news for us that, uh, you know, that children are definitely not going to be disproportionately affected if, if and only if, which we don't pray should not, that there be a third wave. 
I, so I want to push you on that. Let me give you the last word now, and then Chandrakant can wrap this up for us. You you are not convinced that there's going to be a third wave, which is music to everybody's ears. Uh, but the post-COVID complication, I think we should spend uh, one minute talking about it, because even in the first wave, we saw children developing complications and ending up back in hospital. So they were not hospitalized for COVID, but I remember reporting on cases where children were brought to hospital after they had recovered from COVID. Yeah, I think Surbi can take this question because okay, she's been the one who sees the patients. Surbi? Okay. Yes, that's right, uh, Parkha. We were more worried about the post-COVID complications. And in fact, even in this wave, if you ask me at Nayar, what we saw was quite a bit of the MISC that came post-COVID. Mycosis we saw in one child came about three months after having COVID. So that became more worrisome. Those who came with COVID or COVID suspects, we could manage them well. And we realized that many of these children, again, had some chronic underlying disease, some comorbidity, and there were parents who were positive to a great extent, especially in the toddlers that we saw. Because you see, it's very difficult for these toddlers to leave their mothers. They will not wear the masks and they will not stay without the parents. So we saw it more in them, but we could handle it much, much easily. I don't think we were as worried when we took the rounds. We could easily manage these patients. What worried more is the post-COVID complications because the, the uh, affection is such that it is multi-system involved. That is where we can, it can be challenging for us to get the patient and we can have them seen in stage uh, multi-organ damage. So and is, is that good. and is that a small percentage of children? I just don't yes, want to be yes, alarmist. Yes, it's a small percentage. Yes, I just want to say yes, it's a small indeed, percentage. Yeah. Indeed, it is a small percentage of children. But as is known that things are so unpredictable, we never really know what what more. But as of now, it is a small percentage. I okay. Uh, Chandrakant and then Samir, I think, wants to talk about the psychological dimension, which is very important. But Chandrakant, therefore, which side of the debate are you on? Should we be pushing our government for uh, putting the pressure to get vaccines for children? Or do we just count on their natural immunity? Because if it's the second, it's it does mean that schools are not going to open. I mean, I don't even know till when. I don't even think we can put a number on it. So thanks. Uh, I think um, every time I come on your show, I say I have written about this uh, aspect and uh, my opinion that and something similar on this topic. Uh, like in this pandemic, we know that we work with a so, so such a little information that uh, everybody has a risk of being proven wrong and probably everybody has proven wrong at least once or more than once. Uh, but with the, about the children, I would like to say one thing that uh, we need to keep uh, vaccination of children. We need to keep expectations real. We know that risk is low, vaccines are in finite production, the risk to the adults and other population is high, there are parts of the world which are not getting vaccination, all of those things being factored in. I personally don't think that India should or would start vaccination of children, younger children, especially 0 to 10 years before early 2022. It should not start, it would not start. Uh, in fact, there are evidence coming from different parts of the world where which are arguing that uh, to open the school, vaccination of children is not necessary, especially of those age groups uh, which are in primary or up to what we call in India, middle school. Uh, there is agreement that to open high schools, class 9 to 12, you need to vaccinate that age group, especially 11 to 17. And that is what is going to be focused in India, even when, even no matter when the vaccination will be open for children, it will be age group, uh, age descending order, maybe 15 to 17 than 12 to 15 or something like that. I don't foresee that the children younger than 10 years would be vaccinated, uh, as I said earlier, before early 2022. Okay. Uh, second, part, second part and final part is that we need to be realistic, like while we want to vaccinate, but we need to understand that uh, zero to 18 years population in India is around 50 crore. If this is a two dose vaccine that we require 100 crore shots and, they, and there is an opportunity cost, either we use uh, doses for adults or children. And so it, it is definitely going to be a long uh, haul. So we, pa parents need to have a realistic expectation. I really don't know. And I would not say that when schools will be open, but I really cannot comment that schools will be open only after the vaccination. And final yeah. part is that people, parents should expect that uh, not before May or June next year, the children will be vaccinated. And that will still be a good start. 
because i don't foresee the ne- next academic session happening in the on the ground it will still be uh, yeah. online so all things and second and children are not a priority they wouldn't might not be the priority immediately if i so, may just add barkha is very yeah. right that it is above the 10 years possibly if we need to vaccinate because these are the ones who are very difficult to control they will definitely the present generation they will run out they will go out they need to meet their friends yeah. and socialize the younger ones can still be kept at yeah. home and also okay. the academic loss is higher at So, as you grow older okay sami very quickly i'm really i've already overshot my time uh, the psychological impact yes but one question of mine is we now have data to show that there are some districts that are worse hit than other districts right we know that in fact it was the same districts in the first wave and the second wave should we allow localized decisions on the reopening of schools you know it should maybe be dependent on the percentage of zero you know of 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 the r factor of how high the infection rate is i don't think we should have a pan india rule for this i think where schools can reopen we should let them reopen quickly sami last word india is many countries within one country the indian academy of pediatrics in its school reopening guideline has stated that the decision should be at the local district or taluka level having said that nobody will agree that schools will open any time now this is causing a great impact on the psychosocial health of children and parents need to back off from forcing the kids to study and pressurizing the schools to complete the curriculum in fact on your to show i would request schools to consider half an hour every day for just entertainment for the children let them just sing let them play antachi online with their classmates let them have fun and games during the curriculum hours and the curriculum can be reduced please take note of that thank you thank you samir i mean given how uh, uh, grievously the mental health of adults has been impacted during this period one can't even begin to imagine what it's doing to the health of children and added pressure from parents at this time will not help it will make matters worse uh, but thank you to our panel it's been a fascinating and an educative conversation dr shastri dr subhi dr gargi for your serious survey uh, chandrakant lahiria as always uh, for saying it as it is and samir for shining uh, sort of the light on the human needs of children which we often forget uh and really they're the most vulnerable section of our population emotionally even if not physically and we shouldn't lose sight of that we'll keep following the story to our audience thank you for watching and look after your children talk to them don't assume that just because they're playing out and seem okay that they are okay they might not be okay have that conversation with them thank you for watching goodbye thank you it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work If you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent robust journalism